Join spiritual feminist and empowerment coach Joni Advent Maher for Trust Your Sacred Feminine Flow. Listen in for intimate conversations about money, transformation, and feminine sovereignty. And now, your host, Joni Advent Maher. Welcome to Trust Your Sacred Feminine Flow. I'm your host, Joni Advent Maher spiritual midwife and transformational guide. Today, I am excited to be here with psychotherapist extraordinaire, Carissa Rogers. Welcome, Carissa. Is that Thank how- you, Joni. Yeah, that's how you pronounce it. Yeah, Carissa. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you, Joni. I'm so excited to be talking to you today. Yay. I know. Yay. This, this has been a long time coming. We, we've talked about this probably at least four or five months ago yeah absolutely it has been hasn't it yes it's it's been in the making for a while so it's so lovely that we're actually here today together yes Look. yes I had I had been following you online and there are so many threads that we have in common interests yes. and I I want to share with our listeners just a little bit more about you, and then we're going to dive right in. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah, lovely. So, as I said, Carissa is a psychotherapist, and she works in Queensland, Australia. And she is passionate about helping people transition from trauma to triumph, to step on their authentic path and live with more presence she integrates her interests in sacred practice, movement, and nervous system healing. And she has combined her somatic-based training with psychotherapy and sacred practices to create a beautiful offering that she calls Sacred She Retreats. Carissa has guided women to view trauma as a sacred gateway to enter and evolve rather than a problem to eradicate. Wow, that, that, that mm. is quite an invitation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it, um, it just even as you're speaking then, you know, really it opens my heart to, to hear those words. Um, to be able to step into the, the depth of being able to view our wounds and some of the deepest traumas that um, women have experienced as some of the greatest gifts and the blessings in our life that we can use as a vehicle to really return home to ourselves. Mm, yes, that is a, a powerful... Uh, perspective and paradigm and it really takes us out of of being the the victim of our experiences and and restores our ability to be empowered through our life experiences it seems yeah absolutely and and you know that is that is not to say that the women who who show up aren't in that space of feeling like they have been victimized with with you know some of the the really excruciating traumas that have happened to them yes. but it's it's really important for me as a therapist to be able to hold this perspective and in that to be able to offer them them hope and the, the gift of being able to reclaim something else which is which is really the the truth of who they are and their authenticity and to be able to reclaim their wholeness. But when they show up, they, they, they show up in pain. Mm. They, they, they show up, um, you know, with all the sort of traditional symptoms that we, we would call, I guess, that some people call, you know, mental health symptoms. And throughout this journey of, uh, you know, the women showing up and, and, uh, initially viewing this as a problem to be solved, I feel like it, it really is my task over time to, to help them see the goodness in themselves and to be able to see the gifts that some of these issues or problems, so to speak, can offer them. 
Yes. That is, it's really sacred work. That you yeah, do. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, trauma work is, is definitely, definitely our most sacred work. As we, as we really begin to, begin to tend to the wounds of the heart, you know, we, we do that, we have to do that with, with the utmost reverence, you know, as if we are approaching, you know, a holy temple and in this case we are that holy temple. Mm. And to find a way where we can begin to uh, uh, relate to ourselves and attend to ourselves with, with a deep reverence and a self-compassion for some of the deepest pain that we've we've been through is is truly sacred work mm. so i would love to know if like which came first your uh interest in sacred practices or your healing work or were have they been in tandem all along or how, how do they yeah. support each other? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, I would probably say my interest in sacred practices was there first. I, um, I came off a really difficult time in my own life, um, in my, my early 20s, and had really struggled with, you know, difficult relationships, uh, abusive relationships, uh, felt really lost and I guess hopeless and uh, just really no sense of meaning to life and I had tried traditional pathways to to be able to heal and um, it was actually a meditation group that really began to open me up in new ways and where I developed this uh, this interest in how sacred practices can become one of the biggest resources for us as we begin to attend to our wounds. So that's really how it began with meditation and then finding a mentor who mentored me in meditation and spiritual practice for some time. And uh, then, then I moved into uh, studying to be a naturopath. Mm. I, at the time, I had a lot of uh, physical sort of ailments going on, so nat naturopathy felt like the most appropriate path to be able to, you know, heal my body. And it was in uh, the naturopathy qualification where we had to do a counselling subject. And in that counselling subject, I felt like I'd really come home to myself. And it was that moment where I went, yeah, I really want to work with, with emotional healing with emotional wounds and so that really begun the journey and and I went on to um, study uh, do four years in psychotherapy and uh, gone on to study uh, three years in somatic trauma-based therapy as well mm. so, so sacred practices have, have really underpinned that that whole journey it sort of walked alongside me if you will mm -hmm. Well, it's such noble work, I, ha I have to say, you know, to tend to the emotional wounds of humanity. And I, I know part of your story is that you also work with, um, I guess what we call here in the States, first responders. I can't mm -hmm. remember how you referred to them, but... Uh, police and fire and um, rescue squad yes 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 absolutely so I do some very specific work with uh, first responders which we call um, ambulance over here uh -huh. and the the fire and emergency services as well yeah it's it's a really really special work and uh, that that clientele those people are people with really big hearts and mm. you know they they go to their work every day and they see things that uh, the average person would not see in their lifetime mm. yes they're really exposed to a lot of horror and I feel like for me it, it really is 
is a privilege that that I get to sit with them and bear witness to them as they move through the threads of what's left over when they're continuously exposed to to the horror in the world. Mm. Yeah, that's that's really sacred work as well. Yes. So tell me about your relationship with the the feminine and the the divine feminine or sacred feminine how how does that weave into all of this for you yeah yeah great question so yeah if i um let let's go back a little bit and um share with you i guess really the beginning of experiencing the, you know the sacred in in a defined feminine aspect. My first experience really was when I was seeking out therapy myself and it was the first time I had engaged with a therapist, a woman therapist, and uh, we, were, we were touching on some deeper issues at the time that related to my own femininity and sexuality and, and she suggested to go home and make an altar and, and take the issue to the altar. And that felt really profound to me. She mm. said, "She said, take it to the goddess." Mm. And uh, that actually began my love affair with building altars, which I which I call blessing tables. Mm. But at the moment that at that moment that the concept of the divine feminine was new to me, and I had already experienced the sacred in so many different ways but to experience it through the feminine energy was entirely new. And yeah, it's, it's from there that I began to create this relationship by attending to this outside altar, by attending to that mm. with reference and with care, that I began to strengthen this relationship to the feminine. And that has just continued on in my life and it's it's moved into the area where um, I sit with women now and I run women's circles and women's temples and, and workshops. And I, I feel that it's it's so important that to, we come together as women to be able to reclaim, reclaim some of the ancient traditions of the circle way. And so, so much of my own personal healing as well has come through women's circles and I believe that the women's circles are also a portal into the connection with the divine and it's through the relationship with the other women uh, that that we also have that connection to the divine feminine within us and within each other. Yes, those sacred reflections uh, of the divine that is within yeah. that is within us that are held by other women. I completely completely agree mm, mm. yeah and I, I'm I am so struck by your um, work with altars and your uh, just bringing that up because I, I just last week offered a uh, an online workshop around building altars and that that very idea of being able to take things to the altar and and mm meet it with reverence and devotion um, and the way that it's tied into the feminine to me it's it's just mind-blowing how uh, things come together and how the the great mystery weaves it all together that I would be having this conversation with you nobody else oh. I've ever spoken to has talked to about that <laughs> I oh, know, Journey. I saw that when your Facebook event came up, and <laughs> yes, I felt like, oh, here's a kindred spirit. Um, yeah, blessing tables, I call them now. Yes. I have have written a little ebook, which is currently on on my website, about to be pulled down, but currently on my website, mm. supporting women to create their own blessing table, and it, it's yes. something that I do integrate into into therapy and. You know, sort of the deeper underlying principle is in that is is that they begin to uh, get a sense of what it's like to attend to something in a very sacred and reverent and compassionate 
way and and in their own healing journey the hope is is that once they cultivate that way of being able to do that that they can begin to turn to turn towards themselves in that way. So mm. the, the blessing table of the altar mm. becomes a mirror for what we want for the women themselves. Yes, yes. And just two pieces that I have realized recently and having grown, grown up in traditional religion, the altar mm. was always tended by the priest, by a man. So mm. on the one hand, just that idea of taking over um, that responsibility or that creation for ourselves, it's like both putting us in the place of empowerment and recognizing our connection to the divine or to the sacred. Um, so, th so that, you know, I feel like is, is very deeply connected. And then the whole idea of being able to treat the altar with reverence and respect and then you know it's like that transference as you said to ourselves and mm. being being able to even almost see our you know our body as you said as the, the sanctuary or the altar um, and to to give it that care it's it's a beautiful uh, kind of transitional way to do that so Yes, absolutely. I'm yeah. delighted. And, and, <laughs> yes, we, we shall have further conversations about this, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Another thing I think that's really important about that as well is, is when women are, are really struggling with, with a um, particular issue that they may feel that they're, they're stuck on or that is uh, either coming up a lot for them that they can create the altar in a way that is representative of their healing. So, yes. for example, if, if a woman is, is working through, you know, something that she experienced at five, then, you know, I would often encourage her to, to go and build a blessing table and, and get a photo of that five-year-old self and place mm. her on that table with a candle and to be able to talk to that one each day as you tend to the altar so they begin to through through the blessing table of the altar they begin to relate to different aspects of themselves also in a new way yes 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 <laughs> it it yes. it's a very transformational tool yeah, absolutely i yeah. i agree and i i work with uh many of the women that i work with using that uh, using an altar space in that way as well. So I, I mm. just, I'm Love just that. delighted we happened upon that. <laughs> yes, we have that in common. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I know one of the things we talk about here is this idea of sacred feminine flow. And I'm not sure what that means for you, but I love to ask guests about an experience with that or a story of using that in your life do, do you have do you have yeah idea? okay yeah well, let me just think about that for a moment just so when i think when i when i reflect on sacred feminine flow the word that really comes up for me is is trust mm. is is my ability to be really rooted deeply in like a, like a deeper trust that is way bigger than than my minds my small minds limited capacity to trust mm. and trusting that there's something something greater that is is working through me at all times mm. and that I can that I can step into the river of that and of course, there's times where I'm sitting on the shore, <laughs> wondering what the hell I'm doing. But that sacred feminine flow is is available to me. And I think there's been many experiences in my life where I've had to 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 jump into the river of that. Mm. And sometimes I've done that willingly with choice. And sometimes it's probably been <laughs> I've, I've been pushed pushed in. And I think one of the, the biggest times for me would be uh, 
moving from uh, working for someone else, like from employment, to opening up my own practice and working for myself, that that really was a big big deal for me and required a level of uh, of trust to be able to do that and to be able to move into the river of that feminine flow and go with it, even though my mind's like, oh, this won't work, no one will come, you know, all the all the fears that come up and the doubts that come up with that. Yes. Yes, and it, it is one of the places, for example, when we talk about the issue of money, where uh, that whole fear, tr fear, trust dichotomy can, can get activated. Um, so if there's anything you would like to share even further just about that, that transition for you of going into, quote, business for yourself after having been an employee and and how um, you know how that may have affected or shifted your relationship around money. I, yes. I would would welcome that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it, it certainly requires a certain level of um, trust to be working for yourself. Uh, trust <laughs> that <laughs> trust that 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 you're going to be provided for, and. Um, yeah, and it, like when I went into practice, you know, I opened my doors and and it did flow. You know, my practice became full very, very quickly and has been ongoing for for years like that. Mm. And of course, I have moments of feeling like oh, that little bit of fear around the money and and being able to just pull my mind back to, into that deeper trust that that I'm going to be provided for and that in some ways, although I need money to live and support my family, that in some ways the greater work here um, that that I'm doing is is really at the forefront for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. it's, that, it's that really being able to give back in some sense and really being able to offer something for people to have a better life. Mm. So I, I sit more in that, and mm -hmm. that really, I think, supports the money to keep flowing through. Yes. Yes, and it's, it's interesting. It can be a, a tricky, you know, it can be a tricky subject. And, but on the one hand, as we are doing our true work in the world, uh, mm. there is this flow that I believe that invokes. And we still have to um, at least pay attention to it or tend to it in, to some extent. So, so I hear you kind of being in, in both places with that. And, and perhaps that is the masculine and the feminine, where it is the, you know, the place of the masculine, for example, where we need to um, set fees or <laughs> collect money or, or do things yes. like that. And then the, the feminine where it, it is more about that, um, allowing it to come in once we've set that structure. So. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yes, absolutely. And, and of course there's, you know, a lot of, a lot of, um, stuff that are, are, has arisen in me over the time as I've had to set fees and, and sort of, um, you know, Take, take money off people as well. Um, yeah, there's certainly layers that need to be worked through as I do that. And I think we hold a lot of our beliefs around money from, uh, you know, watching our parents, how they did money as yes. well. Yeah. <laughs> so I've certainly had to look at the deeper layers of how, what's my relationship to, to money as well. So that's been quite a journey. An important journey. Yes, yes, for me as well. And I, I know uh, I too, similar to you, come from a, a history of some uh, challenging life experiences. And I, I don't know what it was like for you, but for me, the the worth issue and the valuing of self did kind of get wound up in that, which can also definitely affect our you know our relationship with money or or how we 
advocate for ourselves or set fees or, or things like that in the world um, mm -hmm. for those absolutely. of us that are self-employed. <laughs> yes, absolutely. certainly gives us a um, good opportunity to tease apart some of those worth issues. Absolutely agree. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So I know you, you have, do you have one or two daughters? I have three daughters. Oh, you have three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm surrounded by the feminine. Aww. Yes, three. <laughs> and what yeah. are their ages? How old are they? Uh, so my eldest is 14, my middle daughter is 11, and my youngest is 8. Aww. Wow. Yes. So they're, they're all, they're kind of straddling that coming into womanhood, young womanhood, that transition. Yes, yes, they absolutely are, and it's such a, it's such an interesting time as a parent. I think, um, yeah, it's really, it's really different from raising the little ones to coming to this, this time that feels like a junction, and I, I've had to find within myself to, to be able to adjust my parenting to, to parent <laughs> these young women in, in a really different way, and that's taken, you know, that's taking a little bit of time and, and work to be able to do that and to be able to offer to my children what's required of me now which is something very different to what is required when the children are small. Yes, so can you articulate uh, from, your, from your wisdom place what is required of you now that you have a 14 year old and an 11 year old? What, how would you describe yeah, it? Yeah, sure. Um, but it certainly feels like it's a, it's a meeting them in a new way mm. and being able to see them with new eyes as, as a young person in their own right with their own personality and their own autonomy. Mm. Uh, when, when they're smaller, I guess, they're in so many ways um, are required to make most of the decisions and um, to really be in their sphere so much closer for the care of them and this age, I have noticed it has, has felt like it's required me to just to take one step back, but to still be there as this strong force standing behind, but to take one step back. And as my daughter has gone through her individuation process, I feel like it's been my own individuation process as well. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a, a 13 year old daughter and we're we're in the midst of that. <laughs> yes, it's an interesting time, isn't it? It is. So I that's part of why I asked, like, I was just curious from your vantage point, how you would describe it. And, and frankly, yeah. as, as I was listening to you, my sense is, is it really, you know, it is the precursor to them having their own sovereignty in their own life, mm -hmm. um, which I, I know I want for my daughter, and I'm I'm quite sure you do as well for your own. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and and she certain certainly sh um, couldn't reclaim her or claim her own sovereignty when I was in too close. Yes, 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 yes. That I that seems really important today, just to to acknowledge that, and I. I do want to ask you the question I, I ask all of my guests, which is um, from the wisdom of, of where you stand today, what would you say to your younger self? What would you mm. want to, what wisdom would you want to impart to her? Yeah, that's such a, such a good question. What would I say to my younger self? Mm. I would certainly say to her that her her sensitivity is a gift. Mm. Yeah, as a as a young person growing up with a very deep sensitivity, which I'm not sure was totally understood by the people around me, mm. and. Uh, it became almost excruciating to grow up with that level of sensitivity. And I think there's been times where I've 
I built built walls to try and protect this and so I I would probably say to her that that really that really is a gift and and that's that's what the world needs is actually the ones with the open hearts the mm. ones with the deep sensitivity and and to see that as an offering to the world which is a which is a really different slant to oh this is excruciating I, I really need to find a way to, to build walls and protect this and so yeah to to really tell her that that sensitivity and that open-heartedness is is your best and biggest offering mm. wow mm. wow well carissa i i continue to be astounded at just <laughs> how resonant <laughs> our life experiences and <laughs> beingness <laughs> being beings are it just I feel mm. like you're speaking to my younger self as well and I, I'm guessing there are mm. many listeners that can resonate with that just being deeply uh, sensitive and in tune and it mm. is a profound gift that we bring even when uh, it, it wasn't able to be received when we were younger that that there are those now that can receive it and we can honor it. Yes. So I, I love that you bring that up. And yeah. are, are any of your daughters wired similarly to you? Or? Yes, 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 absolutely. <laughs> um, they, they all, you know, I guess that's something that I've really tried to cultivate within, within them is to, to really protect their sensitivity and allow them to be open-hearted in the world. Mm. Uh, in, in, in particular, my my middle daughter, she has the deepest, deepest sensitivity and such a big and open heart. Mm. And so we do our best to support her in that place um, and to really protect that for her and to be able to like meet her in that way with that sensitivity and with the depth that she brings mm. <laughs> and the wisdom that she brings and there's there's been many environments including the school environment that hasn't been able to 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 meet her in that way yes. so she's my she's my homeschooled girl mm. she um, she does her work at the home in the home and mm -hmm. I felt that was just the best way to uh, to be able to continue to cultivate uh, really who she who she is. Mm, that's beautiful. So, mm, just so so much admiration for you and and your all your gifts and your beautiful work and your mothering and just thrilled that you're on the planet here <laughs> working. Oh, that's so beautiful. Thank yes. you, Joe. You're yeah, what a lovely thing to say. Yeah. Yes, and I, I would love for you to share about. You have a new Facebook group that you um, are just about to launch, and by the time this is live, it will be launched. And I, I think it's really important, and our listeners, many, many, I'm sure, will be interested and want to participate because you bring some wonderful things together so can you tell us about it yeah great i am about to open up a uh, like a private facebook group that people can join if they're interested it's called stress trauma and sacred practice and my hope is is that um i can offer just uh, what i know about bringing these together uh, stress resolution trauma healing and sacred practice because they really do create such a beautiful marriage and uh, yeah to be able to bring that together so I want that to be a space where women can come together in community mm. and to feel a sense of belonging and that we share together and I offer what I can in terms of um, my own journey and and what I've learned from working with women and um, to offer up some resources as well wonderful wonderful 
So I can't believe it, but we're at the end of our time. So we wow. we need to bring it to a close. And I just want to thank you for taking the time to be with us today, Carissa. Thank you so much, Joni. I yeah, it's been an honor sitting here talking to you. And you're right, it's gone really quick. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I really appreciate this opportunity to be able to talk about my work and uh, who I am. So thank you, thank you. Deep bow to you. Aww. And likewise, I'm bowing deeply to you as well. Yeah. And I want to just let our listeners know that uh, they can get more information about you and your work at your website, which is carissarogers.com. You also yeah. have a Facebook group, or I, pardon me, a Facebook page, Carissa Rogers. And then you have the group, Stress, Trauma, yes. and Sacred Practice. Great. Thank Any you very much. Yes. Uh, there's another thing that I'm about to release through my um, website as well, if women are interested, which is uh, just a, a little ebook. It's about 20 pages um, long, which is seven steps to ease emotional overwhelm. So it's, uh, it's got packed full of somatic practices, mm. body-based practices, to really support the physiology to be able to come back into more ease. So I've, I've put some of the best practices I know in there and that is free and available on my website as a download. Wonderful. Yes, I think, I don't know that there's a person on the planet that couldn't use that. Sure, yeah, yeah. And, and they're, they're ones that I use with all my clients as well. So. But, um, yeah, that's my offering to women. Aw, very rich. All okay. right. Well, I also want to thank you, dear listener, for spending your time with us. And uh, until we meet next time, I encourage you to always trust what your heart knows. Thanks for listening to Trust Your Sacred Feminine Flow with Joni Advent Maher. If you like what you heard, the best compliment you can give us is to share our podcast with a friend and subscribe, rate, and review our podcast at iTunes.